Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and I am here with the one and only John Butcher from the John Butcher Axis. Uh, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> really happy to have John on the show. John's one of the guests that is uh, kind of weird for me in the sense that because I remember buying his <laughs> records in the store and uh, he's not that much older than me but uh it's just it's always a weird thing like you know you can't connect the dots you know moving forward I guess yeah I know Craig that was in the horse and buggy days you know, so you know we were we, we we were making records so you know on the prairie so uh you know I understand what you're saying yeah, it was a bit. It was a minute ago. Yeah. Uh, as founder of the John Butcher Axis, Grammy nominee John Butcher has 19 national and international releases, and his MTV and VH1 music videos were the underpinnings of a supercharged music career that continues today. In 2017, John released Two Roads East, delivering 10 new and original songs recorded with special guest stars. This on the heel of John's critically acclaimed CDs Axis Three and the Jimi Hendrix fueled Experience. John's acoustic work on acoustic guitar, dobro, and banjo has found its way into feature film, cable TV, into his live concert schedule, and it's also a major component into understanding his music. He's also had appearances with Experience Hendrix Tour and at Fenway Park for the Boston Red Sox. As a Yankee fan, I cannot condone that, but, you know, to each his own. <laughs> I grew up 20 blocks from Yankee Stadium. Uh, <laughs> and John's output is more diverse than ever. His media company, Electric Factory X, continues to provide film score, soundtrack, and music licensing for television and film, including Shameless on the Showtime Network, The Simpsons on Fox, Six Feet Under on HBO, The Sopranos on HBO, Deadwood, United States of Tara on Showtime, Ugly Betty, ABC, My Name is Earl, and The Life and Times of Buffalo Bill on the A&E Network. John, man, I really appreciate your time. It's such a pleasure to have you here, man. Thanks very much for having me. It's good to talk to you. Um, you originally went to college in Boston, as I understand it, to study broadcast journalism. Was that accurate or is that a... No, no, no. No, my, uh, my parents, uh, uh, they could kind of see the handwriting on the wall that I was going to be a musician and, and, and that I was, uh, you know, c completely focused on, on the guitar and music. And so they said, well, look, you got to have something, you know, how... How parents think you've got to do something <laughs> in your back pocket yeah, yeah. just in case things don't work out, right? So, uh, so I chose a, uh, a, a broadcast journalism school called Graham Junior College, uh, which is in Kenmore Square in Boston, or at least it was. And here's a little trivia for you. Um, unbeknownst to me, um, I was attending that college at the same time as Johnny A. So he and I were, <laughs> were, That's were funny. I know. For exactly the same reasons, he was there because his parents thought it was a good idea to have something in, a, in his back pocket. So we became friends back then. And, uh, you know, I, I've always been interested in television, but I think I just went to that school to kind of appease my folks. Mm. Interesting. Do you know Johnny A? I interviewed him. His interview came out yesterday, funny enough. It's kind of – world can't get any smaller here. Um, did he mention uh, – did he happen to mention Graham Junior College? I'm just curious. I do not think he mentioned that. No, we talked about high school stuff, but I don't yeah. think we talked about college with, with Johnny. Yeah, he and I he and I went to the same school, so that's pretty funny. That is funny, man. Um, so then 1982, Jay Giles, they're at the height of their game with the Freeze Frame album, and Peter Wolf asks you to go and open for them. I was curious how that connection came about and what kind of opportunities did being the opening act on this massive tour lead, uh, you know, open, what kind of doors are open for you? We got, uh, uh, contacted, uh, uh, from the Jay Giles band by, um, a, uh, a mutual friend we had at WBCN radio. Hmm. And as you might imagine, dude, we went from playing, uh, clubs and being successful and, and, and packing small rooms to three nights at the, uh, Boston garden. <laughs> Uh, to, to kick off the tour. So it was absolutely terrifying and also, as you might imagine, thrilling at the same time. Did, uh, you know, usually when that happens, it's you don't really have time to sit and process it. What was like when you're standing on stage at the Boston Garden, 
did you have even it, if you could remember or if you if it happened did, what's like going through your mind absolute terror i i, I mean I, i've literally tried it, it, i remember uh, being in the dressing room backstage and wolf came by the dressing room and and gave me some sage advice which i can't remember at all <laughs> uh and and i just sort of was uh as wide-eyed and innocent as possible and my my memory really is the a, is after those three nights because while it was happening it was completely sensory overload hmm. what was the like when that tour ended did you have an opportunity to decompress or i know that period of history for you was incredibly busy no, there wasn't any time to process. When we finished that, we didn't have a record deal when we started that tour. There was no, we couldn't get arrested by, by record companies. <laughs> and after that tour, after those 70 cities or 72, as you know, uh, all, all of a sudden we were a commodity. You know, yeah. just literally, as soon as the tour was over, our, our manager at the time uh, uh, saw, uh, got assigned to Polydor. Wow, which was a very big label at that time yeah at the time it was uh he, in fact uh, we signed our deal at the same time as uh john bon jovi uh, we were both we were literally in the office at the same time uh so so at that that freeze frame tour was the kickoff of of the whole thing really very cool man it's funny i remember like as a kid, I could see the label, the Polydor label on the record spinning around. That's how popular it was. There's so many Polydor records I had. Um, you had a real popular video on MTV for Life Takes a Life from your first album, The John Butcher Axis. And I read somewhere online, and I was wondering if it was true, that you were one of the first black artists to have a video on Steady Rotation? Yeah, right. Me and uh, Michael Jackson. Wow. Um, at the time, I mean, I can't account for it because a lot has to do with the fact that, uh, 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 at least as I recall it, MTV had a un unofficial color barrier that I really wasn't aware of until we, you know, until we butted up against it. And having, the, having them add our video, I didn't know it was a big deal. At the time it happened, there was no sort of, you know, uh, eureka moment. Right. It was just like, oh, cool, MTV added our video. It was only until years later that we found out that they weren't playing any uh, black rock guitar players at all. I mean, you'd see something b by Hendrix right. occasionally, but nobody knew, you know? Man, what's weird about that is, you know, back then, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, we were living in an age where radio was really, like rock radio was not, like it is today it wasn't stations weren't segregated or niched out that much you know you'd hear exactly earth wind and fire on, on wplj in new york city or w you know all the big rock stations you'd hear earth wind and fire followed by uh jay giles followed by leonard skinnard followed by john butcher axis exactly right and the reason why that was is because at the time uh radio was a frontier and so all, you know the kind of music you heard on any given station was just music yes. it was all new music and there was no fragmentation mm. now of course as you know uh it's it's completely splintered yeah and there is a you know there is a niche for every kind of music and very rarely do you hear any station cross-pollinating at all yeah which is why i don't um like my kids they all make fun of me they're like hey dad you know you should get apple music it's 10 bucks a month and i said you know i don't want to stream because I have like, you know, 40 or 50,000 songs in my iTunes, which I access from the cloud. And I could yeah. just say, play everything from this genre or play everything that's five star. Mm -hmm. And then I get five star songs I like. It's not like, you know, only this or only that. And I kind of prefer that, you know. Well, I miss terrestrial radio for a lot of reasons. As a, as a touring musician and, uh, you know, a professional guitarist, I, I appreciated being able to go to a, a radio station in a given city and make friends with the program director and, and get my record added yeah. and, 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 and have a sort of tactile relationship with, you know, uh, uh, radio and, and, and the people that play your stuff Yeah, and connecting to fans in that way. And that's all gone. Yeah. Yeah. For, for sure. 
Okay, so let's continue down that same time frame. So obviously you guys, after you signed it, you kept gain, pop, gaining in popularity. And then you started opening up for even bigger arena acts like Rush, Def Leppard, Scorpions, and In Excess. Um, what was that like, each, you know, in totality? You have to go through each one. These were packages. The, the, these tours that we did in those years were packaged. Uh, uh, the Def, for instance, uh, it would be Def Leppard and Axis and Crocus. For, Crocus, you know, I haven't heard that in ages. Wow, <laughs> yeah. wow, that's you know for forty or fifty cities, and then there'd be uh, uh, Rush and Axis and 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 Rick Derringer, uh, and and these packaged tours were, you know, were cool because it was a wide spectrum of music. It was a little chaotic though as 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 time went on in terms of, uh, you know, getting tired and worn out from it. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I interviewed. A guitar player a while back and he was just about to embark on a tour and then we had a chance to speak in the middle of his tour and i said to him hey where are you today and he was like uh i said you don't even know and he said no, no. and he said you know i swore that that would never happen to me and i just have no i i'm i, I it's like a blur i'm going from one place to the next i have no clue where i am it's impossible to keep it straight if you're doing um Imagine doing sixty cities, which is which, you know, is which can translate to say seventy five or eighty days. Yeah. And after day thirty, uh, a lot of the arenas begin to look alike. A lot mm-hmm. of venues you're playing, and and you don't see much of the town. You know, yeah. you pull in um, after a, 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 an overnight drive, and you check into the hotel. You go from there to the uh, venue for sound check. You play the show. After the show, it's dark. You go either to your bunk to the next city, or to the hotel and then to the next city. Hmm. Not enough, not really a, a bandwidth for for sightseeing. So it's easy to forget where you are. Yeah, I totally get it. Talk about um, you have a company, Electric Factory X, that's involved with uh, licensing and sync stuff. What what prompted you to set this up, and exactly what does the company do? I saw the writing on the wall somewhere around, um, I don't know, I guess 2008 or nine, that the music business was going through serious, a serious adjustment in terms of both the way music is consumed, uh, the way fans buy it, the way, uh, the, way uh, 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 the entire business was structured, and record companies themselves were on their way out. Uh, as streaming became viable, you know. And so, <clears throat> like a lot of guys, uh, I kind of had to reappraise my career and figure out how I was going to be able to stay a professional musician while not selling records to make a living. Um, each year that went by from like 2007 to 2008, you could see a, a, a reduction in, in, in record sales. And record stores, outlets, you know, Tower Records was starting to close, those, yeah. you know, that chain. And, and so you start to see this and you go, OK, what am I going to do? And I've always had a, you know, I, I've always had a foot in, in media music um, since I got hired to do uh, uh, the Homer and Bart Simpson thing for, for Fox Television back then. And, and I figured that I would continue that because I enjoyed it. It allowed me a, 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 an outlet to be creative. And it was something that I had to network I uh, had built a uh, kind of a network. So I began to throw myself more seriously into licensing music and creating music for television. That led to feature film and indie film and every other kind of thing like that, video games. And and so Electric Factory was that conduit for me to work. Now, what happened in recent years it's, is it grew into a company that now we're a, um, an artist management company and also a company that does uh, – uh, uh, corporate events in addition to um, uh, to licensing music for television. So it's, it started out as a, a vehicle for me to work, and it grew to a business that uh, that uh, has expanded to, to sign new artists. So when you say artist management, can you explain what, exactly what that means? Because I think, you know, that's a very, for the average person listening, it's like they've heard it, but they don't know specifically what it means. Young uh, EFX is 
is particularly interested in finding and cultivating young talent. The next generation of, of, of guitar players or, or songwriters or, you know, whatever it may be. Because we feel, my partner and I, Leighton Wolf and I, feel that um, to look towards the future, it has to be about young people connecting to music, as I did, uh, you know, it, in a visceral way, and and finding uh, finding ways in the world to make that a, a, a living wage, how to make a living doing music as a professional. So we engage with young artists who we feel have promise and talent and have shown an aptitude to, to do certain things, and we help them. We help manage their uh, uh, abilities and try and connect them to money-making opportunities. And that's kind of what artists – that's kind of how I would describe artist management. So you, when you find these this young talent, what is, if any – from their perspective or from uh, from your perspective in looking at them is there any difference between the 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 new musician or the younger musician today and then from you know guys like you when you were their age let me share something with you i i i I'm, um, am working with i'm producing a young band right now in the studio called glimpses young guys you know 16 17 18 years old who have instead of being drawn to hip hop or you know the 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 prominent uh, uh, pop music form of the day, they're drawn to uh, 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 rock guitar as it was expressed in the early and mid seventies. These are young guys who have discovered this music and and are making it their own and expressing it in their own way. And the guitar player's name is Ryan Bowen. Now. I asked Ryan one day, I said, how did you come to like this? What drew you to this style of music and, and wanting to be a guitar player instead of, say, a rapper? And he couldn't explain it any better than I could at that age. Hmm. It just it just connected with him. And that gave me hope, Craig. It gave yeah. me hope that 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 the world isn't just a hip hop world, that 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 there's that there are young people still interested in in sort of mastering an instrument and learning how to, to express art on it and wanting to, to do that for their life. So I met these young guys. I'm producing them right now. And, and Ryan Bowen uh, is, is a, a shining example of young people who are carrying that tradition forward. And that's really good to hear because there's, it seems like the trend is more towards less – less played music and more made music dude i thought that too believe me yeah. and then i met uh there's another young guy i'm i'm producing right now his name is quentin Callowart. he has has gravitated towards finger style acoustic guitar and he's brilliant Great. and i'm working on his first record right now and these these young guys both quentin and ryan have now affirmed for me at least, that that the world hasn't changed altogether. Yeah. But there is still an interest in, in in conventionally expressed music, you know, on instruments. Right. And, and and so that's I, I I'm very encouraged and and I, I and I I think the whole thing is very promising for the future. I'm very encouraged by it. That's awesome to hear. Do you, I was curious, do you have kids and what kind of music do they listen to? No, I don't. I don't. Okay. Uh, my, my wife and I don't have children. Okay, because mine, my, I have three, and they, my older one listens to kind of like they all have their foot in the new music. But my older one, at least, like I can, like if John Butcher was coming to town, I'd be like Nick, let's go see John. He likes that kind of music. You could it's, talk him into that. No, I don't have to. He he actually likes it. You know, he'll we got to concerts together all the time. You know, so is it, he a player? Is he a guitar player? No, he's not. He's not. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. He's not, but he just he he has that. You know, I've probably taken him to uh, all kinds of concerts from like you know Hot Tuna to Government Mule, Almond Brother, just you know regular rock. That yeah, we, yeah. We that you and I grew up listening to. You know, there are two things that I discovered this year or and la 2017 that I discovered in 2017 that have given me huge hope. Here are the two things. First of all, I've, I have discovered that, 
uh, that there is an interest in 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 real music, and by real music, I only mean conventionally expressed music mm-hmm. played on instruments as opposed to just computers. Yeah, and that and that that fire burns in more more kids than you might think. And the second thing I learned is that these young people, um, I'm not sure they're millennials, have uh, developed a huge social conscience. And that gives me hope for the future. Yes, I, I I had thought that maybe you know that that the world was just going to go down the tubes for a number of reasons, you know, some of them political. And seeing these kids respond to, for instance, the gun debate, yeah, and seeing these young people become active and marching and expressing and emoting has filled my heart. I can't even tell you how happy that makes me. That's good. Yeah, a lot of people have have kind of said the same thing that it's the first optimistic thing that they've, uh, you know, come across in a while from that generation. These young people are engaged, and and the the young artists that I'm working with right now are engaged. Man, they're they're tuned in and they're on fire, and that fills me with with uh, huge joy. Awesome. Um. You, I know you got your hands or your your toes in a lot of different ponds. What are you working on now that you're most excited about? Um, again, uh, producing these young people's first records is important to me. Um, there's a mentoring asp- aspect to it too. You know that mm-hmm. that I find meaningful. I mean, at this point in my career, I feel like. I've been really lucky. I mean, really a lucky guy. I've got a chance to see the world and 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 uh, you know and build my studio and my home and my family and 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 do all of these things because of music. And so now, as I look back on all these small accomplishments, I'm really feeling like what I want to do now is look towards the future and pay that forward. So working with talented young people is exciting to me. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm still playing live. You know, I've got a, um, a show I'm really looking forward to coming up uh, in a couple of weeks here in uh, Massachusetts, Rockport, Massachusetts, at a venue uh, called the Shallon Lou Performance Center. I'm looking forward to that show on April 20th. And I, li- and I do a handful of, uh, or more than a handful of shows every year. But my real interest is in uh, developing new music and developing new artists. What you mention your show? What t- talk about the show? Because you were really enthusiastic about it before we. Yeah, started I've the got call. some of my um, uh, uh, touring musician friends joining me. The even- the, the night we're doing is called uh, uh, Spring Guitar Summit, and uh, my buddy Cliff Goodwin from Joe Cocker's band is going to join me. Um, uh, my friend uh, Tomo Fujita who's a brilliant guitar player who uh, schooled John Mayer. He's going to be joining me as well. Um, uh, uh, several other musicians um, from around the globe are coming uh, to join me for this uh, Spring Guitar Summit. And again, that's April 20th um, uh, at the Shallon Lou Performance Center uh, in Rockport, Massachusetts. That'll be on your on either your website or your Facebook? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, it's cool. on both, yep. Okay, so... I know you're like from the Boston area, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I went to, um, um, not originally, um, but I ended up uh, coming to Boston to go to college. Oh, okay. Where'd you originally grow up? Uh, Pennsylvania. Whereabouts? With a stop in Alaska for a few, a few years. Wow. My, yeah. That's... My father, um, I was born in Pennsylvania, uh, but the family moved to Alaska, um, uh, d- during my childhood. Uh, because my uh, dad worked for the government for the ballistic missile early warning system radar sites up in um, Fairbanks, Alaska. And so I had uh, an opportunity to grow up in a really small community, um, l- really small, like maybe 80 people, and and in the middle of the wilderness. So all there was for me was guitar. That was the thing that was my connect to the world. Wow. So you were in Alaska up until you went to to, to college, high school, high school. Of high school. Yeah. And, and then you moved yeah. to Boston. I moved back to um, I, we, the family went back to Pennsylvania so I could finish high school. I had one more year, and then it was uh, off to Boston. Wow. Okay. So what was what was growing up like? What was your childhood like? Um, really, really, uh, uh, 
idyllic if what you like is 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 a uh, wilderness. I grew up uh, about 90 miles from Fairbanks in central Alaska in a community called Liaho. Um, and uh, I went to a, a, a one room uh, school with three grades in it. Wow. You know, I think I was one of four in the eighth, seventh grade. And uh, it was just, <laughs> you know, I didn't have a lot to com- compare it to. So for me, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. And I didn't realize, I mean, I didn't really get my uh, uh, introduction to uh, urban reality and, and life in America until the family moved from Alaska back to the East Coast. And that was, a, that was culture shock. What, yeah, in what way, I would imagine? Well, um, uh, uh, racially, um, I had been introduced to words I didn't know. Uh, when I came back to Pennsylvania, and at that time there was the uh, social upheaval uh, and, uh, and the remnants of the Vietnam War mm-hmm. um, and uh, civil rights. So take your pick. There was culture <laughs> shock every direction I looked in. Yeah. Wow. Did you? Do you think music helped you as an outlet to deal, just to process all that shit? There's no question yeah. that it's it, it, it was the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and all of that music which allowed me to find my place in the world. Um, not just as an outlet, but as a way of seeing myself. I, yeah. I, 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 I sort of came to – I think it happened to a lot of us, right? We became ourselves – uh, a lot of it, it, it to a large degree through the music yeah i like what you said the music allowed you to find your place in the world yeah That's i cool. mean that was the window that was the window by which i looked through and saw who i was the right. music did that for me that's pretty cool did you have any brothers or sisters or you- i have a younger brother uh six years younger than i am he's not a musician um uh but uh, he and I are close even to this day. That's cool. And uh, he's watched. <laughs> he's had quite a laugh watching me take this ride for the past, you know, twenty five, thirty years. Yeah, that's that's really wild. When that you moved from such a rural place to, and then got that kind of culture shock. I didn't. Um... Oh yeah, man. My first year of of moving back to uh, Pennsylvania was horrible. Uh, my yeah. grades suffered i was completely depressed uh you know i didn't know which end was up and who i was and all of this language i'd never heard before uh, you know there was a lot to get used to yeah it's it's weird when you grow up in a big city i think in many ways it's it's probably easier and nicer to move to like a place where you grew up in Alaska than the other way yeah, around than the other way. Yeah, yeah. I could, I could easily see that because it's tough enough growing up there to deal with all this shit going on. My wife, uh, Lorinda grew up, um, in the city of, in Boston. Mm. She grew up in, a, I think the town was called Somerville and, and her, uh, childhood and mine couldn't, couldn't be more different. Um, uh, in terms of, 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 of being young and, and sort of discovering yourself, you yeah. know, so it, it's funny how we, you know, I mean, we met still that the, the, the roads converged at some point, but at the beginning, uh, you know, we laugh about it now, but her, uh, her life, uh, growing up in the city was certainly different than mine growing up in, uh, Liao. You know what? I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause I'm from the Bronx. My wife is from a little village in, mm-hmm. Eng- in England. <laughs> There you go. You know exactly what I mean. I know exactly. And it's funny because she tells me, I don't even think she saw a black person until high school. There wasn't. uh, When I shared with you about language, right? Yeah. You can imagine some of the words I'm talking about. Yeah. Now, now, before before that time, I hadn't seen myself in those terms at all. I mean. There was nothing I had in my personal experience to compare that to. Uh-huh. So it was music and all the kinds of music that I listened to then that gave me a sense that, first of all, I wasn't alone, you know, in dealing with this stuff. Yeah. And secondly, that, that, that there were 
like-minded people like me. I wanted to go to Woodstock, man. Now, of course, I was too young. My, you know, my mom wouldn't let me go, but I was ready to go to Woodstock and, and, and hang out in the mud. I mean, I was a hippie. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah. Hey, what, um, outside of, let's talk about musically. Um, what were some of, you've been at this game a long time. What were some of the biggest challenges you've had to deal with throughout this journey? Trying to, um, trying to find my place in the music business. Um, when you first make records, when you first get signed to a record deal, you're even though you know better, you kind of feel like, wow, I've made it. I got there. And then you discover all you've really done is open the door to the beginning of the race. Hmm. And, and so trying to, trying to navigate um, my uh, art and trying to be a, you know, a songwriter and develop that skill and how to, how, how to do all those things was difficult at the beginning because the forces at play were different. As we've both talked about, the music business is different now than it was. Sure. And the old paradigms have shifted, case in point. Um, I had worked all of, you know, I'd, I'd labored under the, mis the illusion that what I wanted to do was become popular and successful enough to make records and sell them and make a living from that. Well, then all of a sudden the music business, dis you know, that, that sort of paradigm disappeared. You couldn't make records and make a living. Because people were download were beginning to download music for free, right. so that was difficult. You know that was a challenge, and and when the music changed from analog, the music business changed from analog to digital, that was a challenge. Um, I had never before thought that I would have to master computer based recording. Huge learning curve, huge. Yeah. But there was no way around it because things weren't going to go back; they were only going to move forward. You sound like you're pretty um, adaptable with change like that, or is this like the end process of like you know years of just figuring it out and acceptance and just developing a plan B, or were you pretty like okay, you know I got to do something right away? Yes to both. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I was sitting in um, check this out, man. I, I was sitting in my apartment. Um, in Cambridge, Mass. This was on the eve of the Jay Giles experience. Hmm. And even then, even way back then, I knew in 82 that that uh, the, the way of making it in the music business was changing because the ways of doing things were changing. Digital recording was just beginning to be a thing. And even, I remember, t I remember telling Chris Martin, that that you have a choice change or die evolve or die and so that was my mantra from you know f from the from the early 80s on evolve or die you have to be willing to reinvent yourself and i've done that in my career geez, several times so my question was how did you get like that as far as um that's a skill set or a talent. And I'm curious, like, did things in your early youth prepare you for sort of looking at things like, okay, we need to change? Or was it just like a survival skill that you had developed along the way? Because I think at, at a young age to have that like you did, I think that's pretty impressive. I'd never thought – this is an excellent question, and I'd never thought about it until this very moment. And I realize now I have to thank my mom for that. She, she was the one who ne she's she's she wasn't a quitter. She's she's passed on now, but uh, she was a person I learned to to never quit from. I've seen her work uh, various jobs, and 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 uh, survive the uh, divorce, and raise kids by herself, and I think that's where that came from. I didn't even know that until this moment. I, I watched her never quit. Never give up, and that became my mantra without me even realizing it. That's great, man. Thank you for uh, sharing it. Just so you know, when someone tells me I never thought of that, that's like music to my ears because 
my goal is not to not regurgitate anything else with you or anybody else I chat with, whether we're talking on an interview or if we were you and I no, were talking cool. in a bar. My goal yeah. is to not, you know, waste time talking about something that's like, you know, the fish on the wall deal. Um, I didn't realize until you asked me that that my willingness to to switch to another gear or make a left turn or a right turn or whatever it is. Use any you know way of expressing it you like. I picked that that up directly from my mom and watching her do the same thing, and I must have admired that quality because that's where that came from. Yeah, that's because it is a skill set. It, it and it's it's a, you know it's something that that is not like I don't think just naturally inherent. I've never. I don't think I've ever. Uh, um, I had mentioned to you earlier uh, in our chat that. That trying to get a record deal, uh, you know, prior to the Giles tour was an exercise in futility. We got turned down by everybody, and even in those times, when some of my musician friends would give up or get a straight job or whatever they were doing, I was just like, uh, "No, nah, I just got to write something better. I just got to do this better. I just got to figure it out." And mm. so that was that was where I took my entire career. That's awesome. That's good, man. That's a good survival uh, set. I think so. Let me ask you this. If you had to, John of today, go back and give, you know, young John Butcher advice from 20 or 30 years ago, what advice would you have liked to give yourself? Holy cow. How much time do we have? (laughs) As much as you want, bro. (laughs) I I would, man, I would, so many things I would tell young John Butcher now. To start with, um, uh, I mean, it sounds funny, but I would, I would have told myself to stick to my original guns, in terms of, of of music style, and not allow myself to be seduced by the times. Mm. I don't want to point to a particular record or song, but I think that in the it, in the interest of wanting to to be successful, I uh, made a couple of choices musically. That I wished I hadn't. I wished I'd had the courage to stay um, uh, uh, within whatever genre I was doing. Let's just say it that way. Yeah. And and now, I mean, you know, that was way back then in the early days when I was desperate to have a hit record. Now I realize that that you know I would have told myself, dude, don't worry about trying to find a hit record. Let it find you, right. and keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, that is. Um that's one of those things it's really hard to know that when you're younger isn't it well it's impossible to know some things you only come by i know you'll appreciate this there's some knowledge that you can only come by the hard way tuition you can <laughs> you cannot come by certain knowledge the easy way yeah i wish that weren't true but it is true hmm. and, and and so my best you know my most uh, uh, valuable lessons were the lessons I learned from failure. Yeah, I think that's everybody. I mean, you, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, but not everybody sees that, dude. Not everybody sees failure in that way. Oftentimes, we process failure as, as a completely negative experience hmm. from which we got nothing. Uh, lots of people yeah. think of failure in that way. And I haven't lo- allowed myself to do that. I've got to find... I always felt like I had to find the lesson in the failure. Yeah, well, you don't feel like a victim when you do that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you, you, you know, even if like I know me, like when I when something bad happens, I always okay. What what was my responsibility in this? Because then, like I said, I don't feel like a victim. I feel like okay, I screwed up, and I can forgive myself for that. Um, I think the worst thing that ever happened to me. I mean, if I'm g- g- being honest, yeah. Is 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 my divorce? Um, I was I, I've been divorced once, married once, and divorced, and that was the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life. It's the thing that had the the deepest impact and the most devastating result. And uh, even from that, even there, I learned how to be a better man and how to be a better human from that horrible experience. And I carried that forward to uh, uh, my my next and hopefully last marriage to uh, my present wife. 
I carry to her my experience from that and, 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 and trying to be a better person from it. Why was it the worst thing for you? Because of the, if the sense of failure you felt? Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely that. Yeah. That exactly. I, I had never imagined that I would be married more than once, mm. ever. And so when that happened, uh, you know, when, that, when I found myself in that situation, uh, I mean, loser doesn't even express it. Yeah. You know, I, it was dark, dude. I felt like I, you know, it was all, you know, I, I had blown life, you know, here yeah. I am in the game of life and I blew life, you know, now, of course that wasn't true. No, not at all. But that's how I, but that's how I felt at the time. Well, plus, because you were probably carrying around all that shit because you said your mom was divorced and that didn't sound like it went well. And you probably said, oh, I would never, no. that's what you probably had all that <laughs> shit carrying on it's, in your head. You put, you put yeah. your finger right on it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I totally get that, man. I, I understand it. Cause when I got divorced, it was like fucking so free i felt like man i'm so free <laughs> i'm like that i was like this is the worst situation i could have been in. i i could really start like growing and living my life now right and, and i never and it wasn't like I, I had no intentions of you know getting divorced and i didn't want that to happen but it so happened that that's what it was and you know um and your takeaway from that then was feeling uh, uh, unshackled and yeah. ready to embrace life yeah. and living. Yeah. It was one of the few things I did for myself as a young man. I didn't really mm -hmm. make a lot of decisions. Like I didn't really, uh, pr positive decisions for me. I, I, yeah, I had kids at a young age. Um, I didn't really have a good childhood. So I was always like trying to hustle and get out of situations um, mm -hmm. and so it was one of the first times that I said, man, I need to do this because I need to have a good life and this is not going to happen in this particular situation. And, you know, thank God everything, you know, worked out. I wound up, I'm with my, my wife now, 25 years. We, we have a very unique, good thing going. I mean, not, it's not sunshine and roses every day. I'm not going to lie, but no one is. And, mm -hmm. but most days it is, you know, and I'm really grateful for that. Well, that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that because t to me, uh, uh, you have, have, have done uh, uh, almost you, – you, you've achieved something, uh, if not impossible, improbable. And that's happiness. Uh, uh, just achieving uh, uh, happiness and finding your place in the world is almost everything. At least that's what I think. Well, thanks for saying that. I don't, I, I'm certainly not finished, and I always feel like I'm a work in progress. But I'm really grateful for where I'm at right now mm -hmm. with things, and I, you know, we've worked hard for it. And um, I, especially my relationship, people sometimes say, uh, "How did you do that?" Honestly, I have, I mean, beats the shit out of me. I mean, we just worked hard at it, but yeah, I think a lot of it's luck, you know, because you know you change a lot to find someone that can deal with your bullshit and how you change and that it's compatible with the way they're changing. I think that's that, very hard. Yeah, I think this, the odds are slim of that, man, you know, so that's what I'm saying. It's very think, hard, yeah, very I think, difficult. I think I'm lucky. You know, I always, this is a weird thing to say and it may sound like uh flaky, but I always looked at my wife. Like, like I said, I had a really, really difficult upbringing and I always look at that, that the universe came to me and said, all right, look, man, we're going to we're going to give you this situation and we're going to bring this woman into your life and level the playing field. Hmm. And I I've always looked at it like that and so I've been grateful for that because I felt like I got not a lot of people get that. You know, sometimes you just have a shitty start and a shitty finish. <laughs> That's right. You're right. <laughs> you know, and I always I said, "Okay, well, I'm not I'm going to I'm going to you know, thank you." I will honor that, <laughs> you know, and I was just lucky how it worked. That out. is exactly the right attitude. Yeah. Thank you. I will honor that. And let's continue to live. Yeah, right. Let's see. Let's the, let's take let's go on the journey now. Finish it go up. Go on the know? journey. Exactly. Yeah. So I've just been lucky. <clears throat> um, I apologize. This is about you, not me. So I <laughs> talked less. It's all I'm good, sorry, man. man. We're just talking. Um, so this is a relevant question. What is something that you've learned about you along this entire journey? Uh, uh, wow. Uh, um, it, that would be hard to express in one thing. I learned a lot about myself uh, dur during my own music journey. Um, 
I guess uh, now from uh, at least in this very moment that you're asking me, I think the thing I've learned about myself is is uh, that that I'm not a quitter. I mean, I think I always knew it, but now uh, from this vantage point, I'm sure of it. But whatever there is about me, uh, I, I'm not a rollover guy. And I guess that's something, you know. Yeah. I, I, you know, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> It's not nothing anyway. Yeah, it's not nothing. It is something, man, because it's it's easy to quit. Life is tough. Life's not for the weak. No. Uh, is that what you like most about yourself? Would you say? Uh, what do I like most about myself? Oh, I don't know. Let me just pat my back for a second. And, yeah, uh, man, do you it. Know, figure it out. No, no, not at all. I mean, dude, my problem, like many artists, painters, musicians, whatever, is that. We we often don't like what we see. Yeah, that's the struggle that keeps you creating. Mm. I look at it this way: if I was um, completely well adjusted and 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 uh, a self loving man, what reason would there be for me to make art? <laughs> you gotta right? be dysfunctional to keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I am trying to walk a tightrope. Right, I'm yeah. trying to be the artist I want to be while being the man and human I want to be. Yeah. And those two things are sometimes in conflict and sometimes yeah. not. Yeah. But I, I think everybody's a little dysfunctional as long as you manage it. It's within like the normal range of dysfunction. And when it's not, that's when you get problems, I think. I guess so, yeah. You know? What's your, uh, your best childhood memory, John? Uh, I wanted to be, from, from when I was four years old, I wanted to be a cowboy. Wow. Um, yeah, I would watch it. Living in Alaska, I would watch uh, singing cowboys, you know, Gene Autry and mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, and the rest. Uh, and and I, I saw, you know, look, he, the hat, the horse, the gun, the guitar, and the girl. <laughs> so I wanted to be a cowboy, and in some ways I got to be one. I got to uh, – check this out. I, ha- I got a chance to live out my cowboy fantasy by – being in the first episode of uh, Deadwood for HBO, really? I had a, yeah, I had a cameo in it and got all gussied up as the town knife sharpener. That is so cool. So, yeah, I didn't have a, I didn't have any lines, but uh, if you watch the first episode, as the uh, two two uh, protagonists are coming into Deadwood, and you look, uh, please don't blink. If you don't blink, you'll see me on the side <laughs> of uh, on the side of the road. How did you get that? How did that happen? Ah, oh, right place, right time. I was living in California, and I fell into a, a cowboy reenactment group. That's a long story. Um, and and uh, you know that led to the opportunity to to, to uh, you know to be a, have a cameo, and and so I took it. You know, you know yeah. that's actually really cool that you would join a cowboy reenactment group. To be honest with you, because I haven't done enough shit like that. I think that's very cool. You have an interest, do it. I, w- I was living in California at the time, and and uh, I got to be friends with these guys, and just literally one thing led to another, and and they asked me if I wanted to uh, to, to come along one morning, like six a.m., to this a uh, cowboy town where they shot commercials, and so I got dressed up in cowboy boots and a and a funky hat, and I was in um, uh, a Budweiser commercial as a cowboy. Dude, I think that's that, cool shit. That 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 was a laugh riot, so I did it some more. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, hey, you know what I want to do? Let's talk about gear just for a few minutes. Sure. Um, you've always, at least me, I've always seen you always playing strats. Is that, is, it was, did you ever not play strats or? I have a bunch of guitars yeah. of every description. But, but from a live uh, performance standpoint, particularly playing uh, blues and rock, the Stratocaster worked for me because of, of its shape. Uh, the sound of the guitar and the fact that it just sort of fit my style. Mm. So it's not that I don't play other guitars or have other guitars. I have a lot of guitars. It's just that the Stratocaster has been, um, you know, I've, I, I guess I've had the most public relationship with it. Sure. W- what's your go-to guitar right now, and what other, what two other guitars might round out your top three? Um, I've got a, a, you know, my, uh, I've got a 63 Olympic white Strat wow. that I have nicknamed the Fat Man. I play, I play that guitar almost exclusively when it comes to electric guitars. But 
having said that, when I go to record, I bring a lot of stuff in, uh, a lot of my other guitars with me. I have a 53 teleca- Fender Telecaster. So that's definitely one of my top three. And I do a, a, a fair number of acoustic shows a year. And so I have a, um, a, a, a vintage Gibson uh, uh, J45 oh, wow. um, that I use a lot um, on the acoustic shows that I do. So I circulate them. I'm, I'm pretty much a Fender, you know, a traditionalist. So it's mm. usually Fender or Gibson. That Olympic white stress, the one with the rosewood neck that you play? Yeah. Is that, like, are you the original owner of that? No, no. Um, uh, that guitar was made in uh, 1963. And uh, I, I found it in Los Angeles, in L.A. Uh, let me think. Uh, when I first moved to L.A., uh, 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 I guess that would have been 86. Um, I, went to, I went to Ventura Boulevard, or some shop and saw all the guitar and grabbed it and it's been mine ever since. That's cool, man. Do you have any mm-hmm. interesting stories behind how you acquired any of your guitar? Unusual stories? I don't know. I mean, I have uh, <laughs> I've received guitars in every possible way. In fact, um, when I was in high school, um, a friend of mine, Gilord Pryor, gave me a uh, sixty-five Les Paul. Holy smokes. Yeah. And at the time, at the time, I thought, oh, this is great. And now when I look back on it, I thought, that's impossible, you know, for someone to gift it to me like that. So yeah. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget his name. Obviously, I haven't. And, and I'll never forget that guitar. More's the pity that I don't have it anymore. I was just going to ask you, oh, what happened to it? I wish I did. Yeah. I, I've stupidly sold it during my. Uh, you know, uh, struggles to be a self-supporting musician. Yeah. Well, I, you got to do what you got to do, man. Exactly. You're not the first guy, definitely not the last guy. No. Yeah, I know. Um, has, has any, who's influenced your playing that people might be surprised to hear? Um, uh, Richie Havens. Oh, uh, man. Uh, 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 Jeff Beck. Uh, I, um, uh, I think that Jeff Beck is literally the greatest living guitar player, yeah. period, full yep. stop. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, in terms of acoustic guitar, um, I, I have been a fan of Richie Havens uh, since his appearance at Woodstock. I just never got over him. Mm. And so he's a huge influence on the way I see acoustic blues, acoustic guitar generally, and, and a way of... Uh, of, of making music as a solo artist. Yeah, he's a great, great player, man. Just did stuff mm-hmm. really innovatively, very unique, and, and uh, very comfortable. Always seems super comfortable doing his thing. I'm also a big fan of uh, Taj Mahal's. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I like, I very much like the acoustic blues thing. And so, uh, you know, when I think of music like that, I think of Taj. I think of Richie Havens, and and uh, those are two influences on on, on my uh, my own style that people may not be aware of. If I asked you to pick like your Desert Island discs, the top three in no particular order, and knowing that this can change tomorrow, what what are the first right. three D's three CDs that come to mind? I kind of stopped calling them CDs because oh, that doesn't even exist anymore. I know. <laughs> what are the first three albums? <laughs> that's easy. Th- th- that's easy. Electric Lady Land by Jimi Hendrix. Yep. Um, uh, the White Album by the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And uh, probably uh, Houses of the Holy by Led Zeppelin. Oh, good album. Man. And from and, and and that's rock. Now there's uh, you know in terms of like my my blues choices or mm. acoustic uh, guitar choices, I don't even know where to start. Because that music is where I really live, and to pick three, I guess I'd have to start with something by Albert King, mm-hmm. and then and then BB King, uh, uh, and after that it gets really difficult. Mm. Albert was your favorite of the Kings. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah no question about it. Albert Collins too. Yeah. Both of those guys uh, really turned my head around. Uh, Buddy Guy, I know people mentioned Buddy. And I love Buddy. I love modern day. I, I love today's Buddy guy more than I dug him uh, as a as a as a young kid. Hmm. But uh, but Albert King, you know, reduced me to mush. Well, he was so powerful, you know, big giant guy. I mean, he just did stuff. Yeah, he was, he was <laughs> exactly. Really, I feel that big way about giant. Yeah, 
big giant guy with a big giant voice. Yeah, and he played a big ass guitar. You know those flying V's. <laughs> I know it's not like a like a little <laughs> tiny thing, man. And I know. he ha- handled it like it was nothing. He manhandled it. Yeah, exactly. This this might be a a, 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 un, a question that you can't answer. But if you didn't become a professional musician, what do you think you would have done instead? Those questions are really tough to answer because it, 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 you have to sort of go back so far. Dude, I've been a guitar player since, <laughs> I, was fi- since I was five, yeah. literally five years old. So the only other thing I wanted to be besides that is a cowboy. Well, that's a good answer. We'll, call, we'll chalk it up to that, cowboy. <laughs> that's a very good answer. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of money in cowboying these days, but... Hey, tell me something about yourself, John, that people would either be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. I'm not, um, I'm not socially outgoing, meaning um, on, on a Friday night, if I'm not, or Friday or Saturday night, if I'm not playing, I like to, I like to I'm a homebody. Hmm. Um, I, I, I like to be in my pajamas by 10. Yeah. And uh, me and me and Elle will, uh, you know, watch a movie and curl up with a cup of tea. And there just isn't a lot of rock starring around here. <laughs> I hear you. you. Did you have did you have a lot of years of rock starring? Yeah, I, I, I think I did. Yeah, I think I got it out of my system in the 90s, Good to be you. honest. Good for you. Man. You know, by the end of the 90s, I had turned the corner on, on how I saw myself uh, moving forward. And I knew then. Um, that I wasn't, I didn't want to be the guy that was, you know, playing roadhouses at 80. Yeah. <laughs> that I wanted to do, I wanted to do other things with my life that were musical, but, that, that, but, but didn't require me to, you know, to, you know, to live a life of a 20 year old. Yeah, I get it. And I think that the, the licensing and sync thing you did is really smart because that's the only way you can get residual you know, royalties moving forward. I call it mailbox money. Right. And, 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 uh, I'm so, I'm so lucky that I, I, I felt this way, uh, so many years ago because that provides, uh, that's, you know, look, I'll be honest. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, those residuals from, uh, the shows and the TV shows and the video games, all that stuff. That's a big part of my, um, you know, that's a part of my, uh, yeah. Income. Yeah, good, good. And and I and I and I set that I set those parameters early enough so that now it's 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 a uh, it's a good thing. Well, yeah, I think that was real smart, and I'm glad it worked out for you because I know how hard you've mm-hmm. worked. Do you have any uh, non musical superpowers, John? Uh, no, and I sure could use some. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I, I, I hope, you, some, I hope you get them. Uh, me too. I could use any superpowers I could stumble across. <laughs> um, any hobbies outside of music? Oh yeah. Um, you know, I um, I also uh, I guess this is still connected to music, but I got interested in in in, uh, in video and filmmaking. So I uh, produce and make um, all the videos that that that, uh, that that we do. I usually supervise. Uh, I've learned how to video edit, and and as a part of my, you know, as a part of, there is a social media beast that must be fed, mm. and I, for one, couldn't afford to have a film company on on call. Yeah, and so I had to teach myself. Um, uh, how to create images, be video or film, and so that's become a hobby, and I enjoy it a lot. That's great. That's not easy stuff at all. It's pretty involved. No, I had to. It was a learning curve, but again, it was like uh, I can't afford to, to 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 not do this. I can't afford to not have this knowledge. I felt the same way when I learned Pro Tools for you know for recording. Mm, yeah, I can't afford not to know this. Yeah. The pain of not doing it is greater than the short-term pain of having to go through it. Exactly yeah. right. I, I, I have been around many a tech learning curve. Yeah, I hear you. Two more questions, man. Um, sure, man. Person who's had the biggest influence on your life? My mother. 
That's great. I give her, I, I, I know it's a, a terribly hackneyed answer. No, it's wonderful. But I had a relationship with her like a friend. That's great. And so, and so I would often seek her counsel. And, and I feel like um, if I, the good parts of me, I give her the credit for. To instill in me a, a sense of purpose and, uh, and, and, and a sense of not, not being defeated and, and to try and leave uh, the world better than how you found it. That's nice, man. I'm afraid to ask who gets credit for the bad parts. <laughs> well, there's a lot of credit to go around for that. Let's just say it that way. I like that answer. That's great, man. Yeah. And last question, man. What do you think is the biggest, what's been the biggest change in your personality over, say, the last 10 years? And how much of this change has been deliberate on your part and how much is just a natural part of aging? Trying to understand others' points of view. I don't know how you, um, how a person can navigate the world sooner or later without trying to figure out how the other person is feeling. Or processing you. And that sounds simple, but it's really one of the most complicated things uh, to try and get out of your own skull and try and empathize with how someone else is processing a thing mm. to try and, 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 and find peace. I mean, look, my whole uh, journey at this point is to find happiness. And if not, uh, I mean, I, I don't mean giddiness when I say happiness. Yeah, yeah. I mean just a sense of purpose and feeling fulfilled, right? Yes. So to, to, so to do that, it has been incumbent upon me to understand, to better understand my engagements with others, starting with uh, my wife, Lorinda, and extending to my, uh, my, uh, uh, my family, you know, my musical family, my friends. And if I can do that, I think it makes me a, a, a better a partner. I also think it makes me a better friend. And I'm convinced that it, it creates more peace inside me. And less stress, that's for sure. Yeah, there's enough of that to go around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you, man. That's really cool, man. Um, listen, I, I can't thank you enough for your time and candor. I really enjoy this. Um, I want to tell people with your help, maybe, where they could find you. Let's talk about, first of all, your show coming up on Friday, April 20th. Let's let them know about that again. Yeah. Um, for anybody listening who's uh, in New England and the Boston area, I'm playing a beautiful venue on the ocean uh, called the Shaolin Lu Performance Center. That's uh, uh, Friday, April 20th. Um, it's called the uh, uh, Spring Guitar Summit. And uh, that promises to be a, a, an unforgettable night with a lot of musical guests and a lot of stuff. I'll be playing music from um, all over my career and, and movies and all sorts of stuff. I, I'm really looking forward to that. And as far as my new record, Two Roads East, um, that can be found at iTunes uh, um, and downloadable. Um, if you go to my website, you can order a hard copy by getting in touch with us. Um, but uh, Two Roads East is uh, 10 new tracks. Uh, I hadn't done a new record of new music in, in years, and I finished this um, at the end of 2017, and uh, I'm really proud of it. And I would encourage anyone who is interested in, in, in what I do and music that I make to check out Two Roads East, easily downloadable at iTunes. And John's name is spelled J-O-N, so you could go to his website at John Butcher, yes. J-O-N-B-U-T-C-H-E-R.com. And I listened to some of the stuff that he's put out recently, and I listened to that single you did with Tom Guerra. Yeah. And, man, mm -hmm. your playing on there was just as fiery as it was back in the day, man. So uh, it was great. I love hearing that. No, thank it was you, great. Greg. It sounded wonderful. It really did. Thank you. It was really good. And uh, I'm assuming you're on all the normal social media channels? Oh, sure. I can be found at uh, uh, Facebook, and I can be Twittered, and I can be Instagrammed, and all that good stuff. All righty, man. Hey, man, uh, I can't thank you enough. Any final words of wisdom or final parting words? I have no words. <laughs> <laughs> I have no I have wisdom, I'm sorry to say, but I will say this. Hmm. Uh, spring is coming. Thank goodness for spring. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing all my fans um, out, out at the various shows that we're doing, spring and summer. And all I want to do is thank you, sir, for having me on and giving me this opportunity to, to, to 
go on and on. Man, it's my pleasure. You kidding? Uh, and let me just tell people, uh, so April 20th at the Shaolin Lu Performance Center in Rockport, May 19th, Chance Concert Club in Wound Socket. That's like, mm-hmm. I love that name, Wound Socket. That's in Rhode Island. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Gene's Playhouse, Sunday, May 27th, Lincoln, New Hampshire. And uh, the 29th, the Center for the Arts in Natick. Where is that? Natick, uh, Sorry. Massachusetts. Natick, Massachusetts. It's a, yeah, it's a suburb of, uh, of Boston and one of the nicest venues in the area. That's a wonderful place. Awesome. And then the 30th of June. So John's going to be out around the spring and early summer. Check him out. And he's got to show up on his uh, an acoustic show, which is really good, in, in Rockport, Mass, in yep. September, man. So that's cool. It's actually acoustic. That, that, that show is a mix of uh, acoustic and electric. I'm bringing uh, my Gibson J45 for the first part of the show. And the Fat Man, the 63 Olympic uh, White Strat, will close the show with fire and fury. As it should be. <laughs> All right, thanks man. very much Craig I appreciate it man thank you I appreciate your time John everybody thank you so you much bet. for listening I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did thanks so much to John Butcher for spending time with us on the show and for being so open and candid and uh, for sharing some really cool and interesting stories and go to everyonelovesguitar.com sign up to get notified of future episodes along with early product announcements and discounts and remember that happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice go play your guitar and have some fun Till next time, peace and love, everybody, and I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.